Are we on? Oh, great. Me too. Okay, good morning. I'm told that the, uh, the Zoom camera is live, so thousands of people at home are hearing me for posterity's sake, just FYI. Uh, I am Joshua Shane, I'm Associate Director of the Austria County Studies Program and Director of the Arnold Center for Digital Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first event of the semester. It's so great to see people together again, enjoying our, our food uh, and being to, you know, friends after all these years. It's just wonderful. Uh, before I introduce this morning's speaker, I want to point your attention. Those of you who are in the room can pull out uh, the newsletter. Those of you at home, I'm sure Kim will be shortly putting in the chat box a link to the newsletter where you can see a very rich uh, semester of programming ahead of us. Uh, coming up, for example, just in the next week or two, on Thursday at 6 p.m., there's a virtual event uh, on Russia's war in Ukraine, a conversation with Amber Nickel, uh, this Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, next week, we have on September 8th, Thursday night, a conversation with Rabbi Sandra Lawson here in Arnold Hall, who's a nationally known uh, rabbi. Uh, uh, we're very, very pleased to have uh, brought here. And that afternoon, the same day, Thursday at 3 p.m., uh, we have a virtual event, Fighter, Worker, and Family Man, German Jewish Men and Their Gendered Experiences in Nazi Germany. Uh, that's a virtual event Thursday, a week from this Thursday at 3 p.m. A reminder that the lens of gender and gender studies is not simply about uh, adding women to our story, although that's obviously very, very important, but understanding the story from a gender perspective more broadly. It's a very, very important point. So I hope you all can make those events and many others Please be sure to grab one of these if you're here on your way out. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker. Uh, many of you know Dr. Ashley Walters, who joined the college two years ago at a very fateful moment the fall of 2020. What a wonderful time to start your teaching career. Uh, she has been, despite the considerable uh, uh, obstacles that we all faced during those times, has been an absolutely uh, terrific success, very popular with students, and continuing at the same time to be a productive scholar and administrator uh, of the uh, Pearl Stephen Buss Center for Southern Jewish Culture. Her book is already in preparation, and hopefully we'll see it in the next couple years. The tentative title is Love Letters of a Socialist, Progressive Desires, and the East European Jewish Woman. Uh, she also has an edited volume coming out shortly, called Reframing Jewish American Literary Studies Through Women's Writing. It should be out in September of 2023. She teaches a wide range of classes, modern Jewish history, American Jewish history, Jews, gender, and sex, Jews and African Americans, and many others. She works with the Gender Studies Program here and the African American Studies Program here. Uh, is very, very integrated into the college and to its faculty. And it's my delight to welcome her to this morning's program. Thank you. Stage. Um, I think this is the third time we've tried to run this program. COVID took me down the last time, uh, but third time's a charm. The nice, the nice aspect of waiting until now is that my book project has had two years to progress. So I do think you're going to be getting a much fuller portrait of uh, what I've been working on. So I'll just dive in. Uh, my goal is to tell you a couple of good stories today, and then I will kind of zoom out and we'll talk a bit about what what the broader implications of my work are for the field of uh, Jewish studies for American Jewish history and so forth. And so what I'd like to do is begin with a poem. And um, so this poem is titled The Passionate Author to His Love, and I'll just read through it for you uh, right now. Uh, Come write to me and be my love, and we will all the prophets prove that Farna signs signed and sealed and vows epistolary yield. Empty the coffers of thy heart, it's every throb and thrill and part. Search every secret holy nook, twill make, sweetheart, a lovely book. And I will make thee vow for vow, and in my letters mention how, by thoughts of thee I'm sweetly harried, despite the fact that I am married. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> thou right how to my arms thou fly, it twere not for the legal tie, and how straight I'd fly to thee, if from my fetters I were free. These tender things will put in print, sweetheart, there may be millions in it. The public simply can't resist 
the love letters of a socialist. We'll turn our passion to account and realize a large amount. If the plan thou dost approve, come write to me and be my love. Signed, So let me tell you about where I found this poem. The early 20th century writer, Jack London, had a ritual where he would attach a poem inside the cover of a personal copy of every book he ever wrote. And this poem in particular is glued inside the cover of the Kempton Waste Letters. Uh, this is his copy in the archive and the poem that I found. Uh, this was published in 1903, around the time that London's star was starting to rise, uh, but still a year or two before he would publish his most celebrated novels, including The Call of the Wild. The Kenton Waste Letters is an unusual book for London. It's written as an, an epistolary exchange between two men, one who acts as a kind of father figure to the other. The subject of the book is also unusual for London, who's best known for his rugged adventure stories about mining for gold in the Klondike or working aboard a whaling ship destined for Japan. Uh, these are actually photos. Um, this one is the only known photo of Jack London in uh, the Klondike when he was mining for gold. Uh, historians believe this is Jack right here. And then this is not a photo of London, but this is um, the sheep camp right before uh, miners would begin the um, really harrowing trek between uh, through the Chilkoot Pass, which was known as the worst trail this side of hell. And so you can get, kind of get a sense of why why they refer to it as such. So um, the book is unusual for London. Uh, it is a debate about the merits of romantic versus scientific marriage. That is whether one should marry for love or out of a consideration for the physical fitness of future offspring. London was a big fan of Herbert Spencer's theories of social Darwinism in which he um, argued that the laws of evolution apply to human beings and that one can learn a lot about human society uh, through evol evolutionary thought. And so London subscribed to the pseudoscience of eugenics as did many thinkers um, and writers during this uh, particular era. So the book is unusual in that it's the only one that London ever co-authored with somebody else. He wrote over 50 works of fiction and nonfiction, in addition to hundreds of short stories and numerous articles. Only once did he collaborate with someone else. So let's return to the poem here. Uh, we know that Puck, the author of the poem, is Jack London. This was his nickname within the literary uh, circles of the Bay Area with which he associated. He is the author of the poem. The question is, who is this poem intended for? Who is this mysterious sweetheart? We know that it was not the woman to whom he was married at the time, Bessie Mattern. Uh, Mattern is present in the poem, but as the wife who presents an obstacle to the author's heart's desire. The mysterious sweetheart of the poem instead appears to be a collaborator, a co-author of these love letters of a socialist. For many years, London's second wife, Charmaine Kittredge, believed that the poem had been written for her, and perhaps London told her as much. Kittredge did play a crucial role in the demise of London's first marriage, and she also was a, a crucial contributor to his impressive literary output. She actually typed uh, many of the manuscripts and packaged them up and sent them to publishers for him. But we know from the poem that it's not in fact a typist that he's talking about, it's actually more of a collaborator and muse. Also, we know that Charmaine's not the subject of this poem because she didn't come into the picture until well after uh, London had finished the letters. So who is she? Okay, so enough of the suspense. Uh, Jack London first met Anna Strunsky in San Francisco at a gathering hosted by the Socialist Labor Party in December 1899. At the time, Anna was a 22-year-old junior at Stanford University, a rising star in Bay Area socialism, and an aspiring writer. The intrigue between the two was mutual, and within a week, London was standing on her family's doorstep. A tumultuous love affair ensued, spanning more than two years, and it spawned a semi-successful joint literary venture, the Kenton Waste Letters. Uh, it also produced a string of broken hearts and a scandalized 
public. So Anna was born in 1877 in Notes, a small village in Tsarist, Russia. She came from a large brood of children, of which only six survived. She and her family immigrated to the U.S. when she was around the age of nine. The Strunskys initially settled in the Madison Street uh, tenement on the Lower East Side before relocating to San Francisco in 1893. Their large middle-class home became a popular meeting place for Bay Area writers, artists, socialists, intellectuals, and the family name soon became synonymous with energetic, intellectual, and passionate East European Jewish radicals. And it's actually believed that there's two Broadway plays based upon the Stronsky family. Uh, Stronsky was a revelation to London. She was beautiful and charismatic, deep and psychological, and a young woman of East European Jewish birth who challenged many of the theories London held about love, marriage, gender, and race. From their first encounter in December 1899 until his hasty marriage to another woman just four months later, London and Strunsky spent a good deal of time getting acquainted. But London and Strunsky's romance came to a halt in the spring of 1900, when London and Strunsky were sitting on a hilltop in Berkeley, and London decided to broach the subject of, um, of Strunsky's future plans, which their plans implied. Strunsky was reluctant to have this conversation. Uh, for whatever reason, she decided to um, begin talking about her goals of going to Russia to chase the revolution. And we don't know if she was playing coy or caught off guard by his directness, but her answer clearly upset him. <clears throat> and years later, she admitted that if London had asked her to marry him in that moment, she might have said yes, but he didn't ask. Uh, Ten days later, London married a woman named Bessie Mattern, a friend he had known for a number of years, but whom he did not love. Mattern was fit and athletic, and he believed she would be an excellent mother and would produce sturdy children. He married for science. <laughs> so in the wake of his hasty marriage, Strunsky's and London's relationship retreated to their correspondence in a shared literary undertaking that would produce the Kempton Lace Letters. This helped the two uh, maintain an appropriate degree of physical distance, if not spiritual. At the core of this literary project was a dispute over why London had married Matter. Strunsky believed marriage should be based on uh, love and spiritual connection. London believed one had a duty to uphold the supremacy of the Anglo-Saxon race, or at least that's what he told himself when Strunsky appeared unattainable. And I don't want to give anything away in case some of you plan on reading the Kempton Waste Letters yourself, uh, but people tend to agree that Strunsky emerged victorious in this debate. While London not only failed to make a compelling case, he ended up falling into a depression during this time. And I would love to show you the string of letters, the one uh, that London sent to Strunsky during this time. Uh, we fortunately have all of London's letters to Strunsky, but London did not keep the letters that Strunsky sent to him. Uh, but if I go through these letters, we'll never never make it to uh, Anna's sister. I will say I'm not really a fan of Jack London's writing, um, and he clearly from the first poem we began with, you can see he wasn't a very talented poet, but these letters, these letters are really something. And I'd like to share my favorite with you because I think it really captures the despair he felt um, during this time. So in December 1900, London wrote to Stronsky a letter to welcome in the new year. By this point, he's married. He has a baby that is due any time now. Um, and he's supporting three separate households. He's supporting his own, his mother's, and uh, a, a woman named Jenny Prentice. It was, she was a black woman who had served as his wet nurse and essentially raised him during the first few years of his life. And he's supporting these, these three households um, when he has not yet been discovered as a writer. So he's very stressed out. Um, so he writes to Stronsky about the sense of entrapment he feels. I remember now when I was free, but now one's hands are tied. One may not fight, but only yield and bow the neck. After all, the sailor on the sea and the worker in the shop are not so burdened. 
To break or be broken, there they stand. But to be broken while not daring to break, there's the rub. Then he hinted at his feelings for her. Why, you've been a delight to me, dear, and a glory. Need I add a trouble? For the things we love are the things which hurt us, as well as the things we hurt. What you have been to me, I'm not great enough or brave enough to say. This false thing, which the world would call my conscience, will not permit me. Right? Yeah, so it's a, you know, it's a really, it's a beautiful letter and it's so sad. You can really feel the depths of despair that he's feeling at this particular moment. So in the spring of 1902, London convinced Strunsky to join him at his home in Oakland to finalize the letters. While there, he told Strunsky that his marriage was over, it wasn't, um, and suggested that they run away to New Zealand or Australia. Initially, she agreed, uh, but she harbored reservations, as did her mother, who told her uh, to consider what life would look like with London once the passion had cooled. Two weeks later, Strunsky returned to London's home to break her promise. Whatever transpired there that day, we don't know, but she, but London appears to have won her over, and a particularly intimate train ride followed. By June 1902, he was signing his letters, Your Miserable Sahib, and writing, I am sick with love for you and you for you. In July, London left for Europe, sending affectionate letters from every stop. While away, London's mother revealed to Strunsky that Mattern was expecting a second baby. While away, um, Strunsky uh, was very conservative in matters of sex, and she was furious, believing that London had lied to her about the platonic nature of his marriage. And she dashed off an enraged letter that put an end to their relationship for good. London was devastated. Her letter closed a chapter in his life that he would never revisit. Strunsky, meanwhile, had written in a moment of anger and regretted her actions almost immediately. She was unable to fully accept the finality of their break and continued to pursue London for a time. It was not until early 1905 when news of revolution coming out of Russia redirected Strunsky's attention and ultimately gave her a new lease on life. So now that I've introduced you to Strunsky's and London's relationship, I want to address the subject of Jewishness, especially in London's extensive literary archive. So from the outset of their friendship, it is clear that Strunsky's Jewishness was an intriguing novelty and something London was eager to explore. And I'm realizing you probably can't see this, so I'll explain what's on the screen in a second. So within a week or two of meeting Strunsky, London sent her a story draft he'd been working on about a young Jewish character named <coughs> Jakey, supposedly based on a shopkeeper he knew in Oakland. We don't have a copy of this short story, but whatever he wrote upset Strunsky because she ended up replying to him um, that she didn't like his depiction of Jews as always bargaining and um, haggling. And um, so this is what the only copy of a later rewrite of the story that I could find, but it shows that he was working on this story for a while. Ultimately, he decided not to publish it. In a subsequent letter, London included a, for a photograph of East European Jewish memoirist, Mary Anton. And the following week, he sent along a review of Anton's memoir, confessing, had I not known you, I could not have understood the little which I do. Like most modern Jewesses who have written, she is, I fear, destined to spiritual suffering. London often described Strunsky to his friends as a Russian Jew. In one letter to a fellow writer, London praised Strunsky as a young Russian Jewess of Frisco. She happens to be a genius. She is also a materialist by philosophy and an idealist by any preference. To another friend, he wrote, she loves grounding. She is deep and subtle and psychological. She is neither stiff nor formal, very adaptive, knows a great deal, has a joy and a delight to her friends. She is a Russian and a Jewess who has absorbed the Western culture and who warms it with a certain oriental leaven. Strunsky's appeal was not solely intellectual. Joseph Knoll, a journalist who hung out with London's crowd, wrote that London was constantly surrounded by intelligent, eligible, play-reading women of the Bay District, 
who were alert to the opportunity of marrying a man who was on everyone's tongue in California and destined to become a world figure. Out of all of the eligible candidates, Strunsky stood out with particular prominence. Noel described Strunsky as a pretty little ingenue who played the part of a Stanford University intellectual to perfection. She had soft brown eyes and a kindly smile and a throaty little voice that did things to your spine. Elsie <laughs> Martin as Whitaker remembered Strunsky for her messianic magnetism. Women admired Anna, but resented the attraction their men felt for her. Beautiful, I would say. The Israelite woman can be completely irresistible without the taint of a flirt. She was beautiful, fine features, smoldering eyes, a wide, generous mouth, and above all, a soft, vibrant voice. She had a deep messianic feeling, whether for socialism or women's rights, that was appealing and compelling, and to which even the women responded. Later, she concluded, Annas was the burning spirit that matched Jack's, the inner burning spirit of the Jewish people. So London was a prolific writer, always on the hunt for new material, and he was eager to explore fictional characters from different backgrounds, whether it be indigenous peoples of the Northland, Northland or inhabitants of the Pacific Islands, or even Jews. At a time when racial, imperialist, and nationalist thought saturated much of everything, London displayed sensitivity to racial others with uneven results. And so as a result, um, characters inspired by Strunsky, whether it be the de-Judaized versions of her that actually made it into print, or London's unpublished story sketches about an unnamed, captivating, and fatalistic East European Jewess, were a way to explore evolving ideas about race and gender, while also navigating his desire for an unattainable woman. And it's this dichotomy in London's writing that I find so interesting. Anglicized versions of Strunsky appear in print. For example, his first novel is about a young Stanford University graduate and intellectual who walks around spouting uh, poems by Browning, but she's not of Jewish heritage, she's Welsh. Okay. Uh, East European Jewish characters, however, never appear in print. And I'll talk about this more in a little bit, but mm -hmm. London's erasure of Jewishness in his published work was something that many authors, including Jewish ones, were doing at this time. So when it came to East European Jewish characters, it's interesting to consider how their on-again, off-again relationship may have impacted London's writing. London was not anti-Semitic in any expressed form and clearly sought to understand Strunsky and all of her complexity. Despite this, a degree of um, sexism and racial chauvinism <coughs> colored his perspective. As he grew increasingly frustrated with his unrequited desire for Strunsky, he began to articulate the incompatibility of men and women from different racial and class backgrounds in his fiction. So what I want to do is show you a few examples of what I found in London's archive at the Huntington Library in San Marino. I know there's some students in here. If you're going to find an archive to do research in, this is the one to do it, and that's amazing. Um, so um, one of the uh, story sketches that I found, this is a story that he never actually wrote, never made it into print, but he outlined the story here. And so because I know this is hard to read, I actually typed everything out that he wrote here. So the story is titled A Socialist Novel, it is about a Russian Jewess alone in the world. And the setting of the story is that of um, kind of socialist meetings and it's described the, the cosmopolitanism of um, these settings. And then he writes, this is kind of the plot of the story. Man conquers the Russian Jewess by sheer strength and force of will, will etc., in spite of herself. Natural selection operating on female so long, which leads her to choose strong male, etc. Only she must be conquered, mastered by his strength, unconsciously, the hereditary recoil against force, how her whole nature flutters madly up in revolt as soon as she is aware that force, intellectual and spiritual as well as physical, is being used. Instance, the kiss is taken by strength. Let this incident be the key to the peculiarity of, this, of her position. 
So what makes this a socialist novel is not really clear. Um, one literary scholar has proposed that the character of the Russian Jewess is um, what allowed London to bring these different elements together, and I think this is true. London is interested in situating the Russian um, Jewess in the context he most readily identifies her with, that is um, the radical left. Socialist revolution, however, is never intended to be the driving force of the novel. Nature ultimately is going to determine the victor in this struggle, in this elemental struggle between man and woman, woman Anglo-Saxon and Jew. Um, so the kiss taken by force can absolutely be read as an assault fantasy, and this kiss is representative of the broader elemental struggle between man and woman common in London's writing. Um, in fact, the sexual politics of this proposed novel are not unique to Strosky, um, and they closely mirror the power dynamic between male and female protagonists elsewhere. So, for example, London stories set in the Northland portray the submission of indigenous women to um, white colonizers. Also, in one of London's better novels, Marked in Eden, maybe some of you know it, it depicts a similar struggle between a working class man, largely based on himself, and an upper class woman. Um, it's tempting to read this story in terms of London's sexual frustration with Stromsky, who had been unresponsive to his advances from the very beginning. Uh, early in their friendship, London tested her. Uh, he wrote to her asking, may I see you next Friday night? Candidly, I may sometimes steal you or certain portions of you for exploitation between covers <laughs> unless you hasten to get yourself copyrighted, which is to say preliminarily that I should like to sum you up some more. So, <laughs> um, so he soon learned that his attempts were hopeless. His love interest, both pressed and thought, was very conservative in matters of sex. Uh, London complained to a friend, it would have to be marriage if anyone went after him. You know what a hell of a fuss these little intellectuals make about their virginity. <laughs> so it was well well understood among Bay Area circles that while Strunsky and London were in love with one another, their relationship remained unconsummated. And I've actually asked Strunsky's grandchildren whether they think Chuck London and Anna ever slept together, and they're divided by what is clear is that they've clearly spent some time debating this amongst what <laughs> um, Okay, so London's intentional erasure of Jewishness is apparent elsewhere in his archive. Um, in the summer of 1902, London traveled to London, England, uh, to conduct research on the English working class and write an expose. So this is the moment when London left and his mother told Stronsky that London's wife Bessie was expecting and Stronsky sent off this angry letter that um, ended their relationship. So London arrives in London heartbroken and he's going to now do this research for this uh, book. So he took notes during his trip, which are preserved in his papers, thank goodness. And in his notes, he describes East European Jewish sisters that he meets. He describes them according to the same permanent cheekbones and strong, um, I can't read whatever word that was, jaw, the same brows, heavy and lifted yet lowering, the same proud breast and poison head, etc. cetera. Um, so the, the words he's using to describe these Russian Jewish sisters that he's met while he's living in London are essentially the same words that he uses to describe Anna Strunsky, including Proud Breast. Proud Breast appears all throughout his um, archive when referring to her and in his letters to her. Um, and so it's it's interesting because it's almost as if Strunsky is becoming kind of this physical and spiritual representative of East European Jewesses. But what's really fascinating in reading through these notes, I can see that he was encountering East European Jews while he was doing the research. But when he wrote his expose, which became known as the People of the Abyss, Abyss um, Jews are completely missing. And it's amazing. Someone can write a expose about the working class of the East End of London, which has a very, very large East European Jewish immigrant population, and not include Jews in the story at all. 
And so it raises some really interesting questions. Did London write Jews out of the story because on account of his broken heart? Or did he and his editor believe that um, a sympathetic portrait of the English working class was more likely to sell than one about Jews? Um, Jews only factor into his book when he describes the anti-Semitic rhetoric of the English workers. And he just kind of uncritically notes what people are saying and moves on without really addressing it. So um, I do have another story sketch with me, but I'm mindful of the time. So I'm going to skip over this um, in the Q&A if people want to go back to it. I promise it's a pretty wild one. Um, I'm happy to. Um, but um, I do want to say before I kind of move on, uh, one point that I do want to emphasize again, because this is going to come up in St. Clair Lewis's writing about Rose Strunsky, is that when the relationship doesn't work out, uh, the kind of racial difference that had once been so intriguing to London becomes the way in which he justifies their failure. In his mind, it's this racial difference that's ultimately preventing them from kind of having this relationship. And Sinclair Lewis is essentially going to see the same thing. So in 1905, Anna packed up and moved to Russia with her sister Rose. These are some headlines that ran in the newspaper during this time. Um, and they went at the invitation of a wealthy Anglo-American socialist, William English Walling, who had just established a revolutionary news bureau in Europe. The goal was to publicize what was going on in the revolution in the hopes of preventing uh, foreign governments from loaning any more money to the Russian Tsar. Um, Walling had been watching Anna and very interested in her for a while. Um, and so he invited her and her sister to join him and the pretext under which he invited her is really the subject of another chapter of my book. Um, it's a pretty, pretty interesting story. So eight years after London's and Strunsky's affair came to an end, Anna's younger sister Rose found herself being courted by a young writer in Greenwich Village named Harry Sinclair Lewis. He had recently arrived after an unsuccessful year of newspaper work in San Francisco. He moved into a cheap boarding house in Greenwich Village, as all aspiring writers were doing at that time, and attempted to integrate himself into a number of literary and political circles. He also began to pursue a number of romantic interests that proved really disappointing. Um, to say that Sinclair Lewis was socially inept would be an understatement. He had a really hard time. Um, and there's some pretty wild stories about him and his behavior toward the women he was trying to court during this time. Um, it's not clear at what point Rose and Lewis became acquainted. Rose had recently arrived in Europe after, or arrived in New York after an extended stay in Europe, and she was busy working on a Marxist biography of Abraham Lincoln and English translations of Tolstoy. In the winter of 1910, Lewis invited Rose to attend the anarchist Christmas time ball with her with him and she declined his invitation. He would continue to pursue her until she left for Europe in January 1911. So Rose is the less well known of the two sisters and there's a number of reasons for this. One of the main ones being that Rose suffered from a disability as a child that really kept her out of um, the public eye for a long time. Despite this, I think it's important to note that Rose was a far more disciplined writer than her sister. She boasted an equally illustrious lineup of suitors and was the more radical of the two. While in Russia, Rose attained fluency in Russian, Swedish, and maybe even Finnish, and became a well-respected translator. For a long time, her translations of Tolstoy were considered among the very best. Her fluency also allowed her to participate more fully in the revolutionary scene. While Walling and Anna were busy consorting with famous revolutionists, and um, state, statesmen and authors in luxurious settings in St. Petersburg and Moscow, Rose chose to live and associate with radicals on the ground, which even helped her, she even helped hide radicals from Tsar's authorities. And it was her involvement with Finnish radicals that ultimately led Russian authorities to arrest and expel Rose, Anna, and William English Walling from the country in 1907. 
So while trying to court her, Lewis wrote a series of unpublished love poems that convey how his unrequited desire for an East European Jewish woman translated into wider ambivalence about masculinity, sexuality, race, romance, and urban life, all these things that are being contested at this time. I have to say, when I went to NYU to look at this mysterious file of um, poems that uh, Sinclair Lewis wrote to Rose Strunsky, I had no idea what I was going to find. No biographer has ever acknowledged these poems that Lewis wrote. And when I opened up the file, what I found was just one of those moments where you could fall out of your seat and you just know that your entire project has changed. Um, there's about 30 poems and they're just, they're incredible. So what I want to do is just um, kind of share a couple with you. Uh, maybe I'll share a couple, maybe one or two for the sake of time. Um, but I do want to point out that, you know, these poems are really more of a fantasy that Lewis has created about Rose because it would appear that she was not really an uh, active presence in his life during this time. And one poem titled the Proud Beggar, he wrote, strange that a woman, little flat and brown, quietly smiling, thinking not of me, a star whose orbit scarce has touched on mine, should, without even wishing, own my soul. Okay, so it appears that Rose's presence is really um, rather an attendant, um, uh, rather a uh, sporadic one, and that she's not really aware of the impact on his life. life. Um, other poems mention that they did occasionally spend time together. One poem implies that they may have kissed, but again, it's really, really hard to tell what's, what's back from the fantasy within these poems. Um, within the poems, Lewis does point to Rose's personality, her kindness, her happy demeanor, confidence, and radical propensity, all traits that he saw as lacking in himself. And it's here that we really begin to see Rose's inner beauty and revolutionary spirit begin to assume a larger than life stature. Um, in one poem I found titled The Sleeping Roads, he writes of the pangs of revolution, Russia's morning throws, shall, shall they fail as fail they must, some smiling rose. And elsewhere he refers to her as a noble presence that Tolstoy knew and so forth. So there's a couple of poems that are particularly interesting that I wanna highlight. Uh, one poem I found that is incredibly long, lengthy, it's kind of an epic, um, is he wrote a poem about Rose's former ties to the Bohemian circles of her youth. So when Lewis had been spending some time in California, he had been hanging out with the Stromsky sisters, former friends and lovers, including Jack London, including Xavier Martinez, the Mexican-American painter who was Rose's first serious boyfriend, and several others. And by associating with them, he started to learn about um, these, in, uh, these two sisters well before he actually met them. And so he writes this poem that kind of blends their California past with a revolutionary future. And this is what he writes. The last Chianti flask is broke at Marty's. Our Rose is gone, and will she not come back? No more can Marty sing us La Paloma. George writes a part and tame the wolf of Jack. No more the long hours tense with Marcus and Nietzsche. No more the just light lives and widened eyes. We've fled the cities. Marty's gentle Rosalie was stolen, and now the one night long the city cries. There's revolution on the Rio Grande. The rebels bear the banner of the rose. Men talk of you, men fight with you, men charge the thunderous night for you. Your stirring name the hid over your nose. Great rose of revolution, how they love you in California, East, and North, and West. So it's, you know, it's one of those poems that really makes you wonder to what extent Lewis went to New York with the intention of meeting Rose, um, given these kind of stories um, he had heard about these legendary Strunsky sisters. Um, but what's really interesting here is kind of the, the depiction of Rose as this kind of revolutionary, this radical and lover to all with their band of lovers slash revolutionaries kind of conquering the West. It's very different than the, the reserved and modest rose that everyone knew in real life. And finally, one last poem I want to share and then I'll kind of sum this all up. 
Um, this is a poem I found um, that, you know, this is a moment when Sinclair is realizing that his, um, his feelings for Rose are not shared. And so he's kind of lamenting um, that, you know, this is just something that's not going to happen for him. But the, the terms in which he describes it are so, so interesting. I'm not sorry that my love for Rose is Anglo-Saxon, homely work a day, the unromantic comradeship of Gray, kind pioneers who faced my prairie snows and trudged the dusty cornfield stifling rows. Far too laborious the little way, they crept with comrade wives to let them play with passion or toss points with tragic woes. Such love bears not a sword, but rapes and hoes, <clears throat> prosaic tools to cultivate a rose that's bringing sun-baked serviceable steel. Yet I am glad my Celtic blood's appeal has made me thrill when Celt fizzled sings, hence with these new rose mystery of things. So here, here we can see that the, the hero acknowledges that his Anglo-Saxon blood has its merits from self-sufficiency to the, the virility necessary to claim loyal comrade wives, presumably also the Anglo-Saxon stock, who possess a pioneering spirit similar to his own. Um, with that being said, you know, we don't really learn much about uh, the woman protagonist. We can kind of assume that Rose is representing something, something else, something unsettled and ethereal, a personality akin to the delicate flower with which she shares her name. It is clear that their racial difference is what's going to ultimately uh, keep them apart. In late 1910, Rose returned to Europe, and Lewis quickly directed his attention toward other women in New York, including Sonia Levine, who was an aspiring writer and was also a central figure in my book project. Uh, by the early 1920s, Lewis secured his place as the premier critic of small town America, and um, consequently, East European Jewish women he had once captured so vividly in his poetry are relegated to the margins of his novels, appearing as minor characters who illuminate the less desirable aspects of the United States. Okay, so I just want to wrap up um, and put these um, two stories into a much uh, larger picture. Um, so when I when I went on the academic job market and was preparing to give my job talk here at CFC, I gave a practice talk at um, my alma mater before a group of faculty and grad students. And when I finished, one of the attendees told me that they were very concerned about a woman standing up in front of an academic audience talking about romance, that it might get dismissed as unserious, that it might play into stereotypes that abound about gender, and intellectuality and emotion and so forth. Um, it was a great point, uh, not one I wanted to hear before I was about to hop on a plane and interview for a job, but it was, it was a really great point. And it was one um, that I had not really thought about because I see so much value in exploring the history of desire and how it intersects with uh, ideology, political contingencies, and cultural trends. We take the study of anti-Jewish hatred very seriously, as we should. We have a couple of uh, faculty who teach and write and speak on anti-Semitism, and they're fantastic, and you should take their classes. I like to think of myself as someone who studies philo-Semitism, who addresses the ways in which a life or love or fetishization of Jews and Jewishness also has a rather dark and pernicious Side to it. I don't really see anti-Semitism and philo-Semitism as being um, um, opposites. I see them as being really two sides of the same coin, one in which Jews are flattened into an abstract and reduced into mere symbols for the utility of others. And so when I, when I study the history of desire, whether it be consumer trends or kind of these patterns in courtship and marriage, these broader social trends emerge. And I think it's, it's important for us to pay attention to this. We're at a moment when the study of emotion is really gaining traction in the academy. And there's been some really fantastic, fantastic studies dealing with desire, especially by and about women of color. Uh, the late great uh, black feminist theorist, um, educator, Bell Hooks, for example, theorizes in an essay titled 
eating the other about America's how Americans have a long history of consuming women of color for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the best and most gorgeous pieces of scholarship I have ever read is Sadia Hartman's We Were Lives Beautiful Experiments. Her book looks at the revolution of Black women's intimate lives that occurred in Harlem in the 1920s, a time when much of the country was captivated by Harlem and the Black culture emanating from there and how this impacted um, desires for Black women among white audiences. And I think in a sense, my work precedes her because I study a time and a place just before this when much of the national eye is on East European Jewish women um, and what they ultimately are symbolizing to a country struggling to define itself. Um, so, you know, I do want to point out the character of the, the beautiful Jewess has always occupied a unique place in Western culture. Um, many scholars have written about this. What I see happening during the period I study, the progressive era prior to the First World War, is that these women are taking on kind of new, new, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, kind of new aspects of um, their identity and how people are eager to understand and um, associate, maybe even um, be in relation with them. And I think this is happening because people are paying attention to um, to uh, sex work, which is readily associated with East European Jewish immigrants. They're paying attention to the free love politics of anarchists like Emma Goldman and the performers of actors such as Sarah Bernhardt, and they're they're creating these, um, these perceptions of unorthodox sexualities in addition to all of the immigration debates happening at this time. And so what we see is East European Jews really begin to take on this new kind of cosmopolitan and intellectual um, uh, intellectuality, which is really derived from their ties to European culture and socialism. So in just kind of situating these stories, um, you know, if we keep the historical lens small, we can see that Jack London and Sinclair Lewis are dealing with anxieties through their desire for these women and how they write about them in their unpublished archives. If we broaden the lens um, a bit more, we begin to see that there's actually several women who are appearing um, on the scene as writers, but also as um, being in intimate relations with prominent um, Anglo-American intellectuals. And if we include the men, these are ultimately many of the people who end up playing a part in the book, all of whom were writers in one way or another and um, produced um, images of the East European uh, Jewish women that we now have today. And so um, I do want to point out that while the Pre-World War I era was one in which people on the left were particularly eager to associate with East European Jews and maybe even um, uh, have romantic relationships with East European Jewish women. Um, this is not something that lasted. With the First World War, mainly the US's entry into the First World War in 1917 and then the Bolshevik Revolution that took place later that year, the U.S. very quickly turned its back on Russian revolutionists, including these women. Many of the marriages that are um, depicted here uh, fell apart in the wake of the First uh, World War and Revolution. Some of them turned abusive. Uh, several of the men turned to drinking and had affairs, and many of them ended in divorce during this time. <laughs> and so it's really interesting to think about how America's romance with the revolution in Russia you know, had this kind of lifespan that came to an abrupt end. It was the same for many of these relationships. Um, and, but that's not the note I want to end on. The note I do want to end on is in the 1920s, despite the breakdown of these relationships, um, we do begin to see um, uh, some of these women kind of emerging as their own voices, whether it be as um, authors of fiction, or um, Sonia Levine, who became a prominent, arguably one of the most celebrated Hollywood screenwriters. They were eager to depict East European Jewish women's sensibilities 
uh, for a new generation and eager to do so for very broad audiences. And in doing so, I think they were really important voices in producing a new kind of cultural mythology about the East European Jewish woman. Uh, one that was really rooted in concepts of individuality, industry, and consumerism. Okay, I think I should probably stop. I've gone like a long time. Thank you so much. I'm happy to. <laughs>
Does it? Did you hear any hints in the archive about whether or not he had considered where his own eugenic racism might end when it came to possibly ending up Mary Stronsky? Yeah, that's a question? good question. Um, yeah, so <coughs> it's it's hard because it's very clear that um, Jack London got rid of everything related to Stronsky, perhaps in the, the wake of that bad breakup. And so we don't really know what he was thinking about her um, as kind of time progressed, as he became a more successful writer, as he moved away from socialism and more toward these kind of um, imperialist um, depictions of, um, of um, uh, white men that are so common to his writing. Um, I think that had Strunsky been available and interested and willing to marry him, uh, that, you know, his, his kind of thinking and life path may, might have taken a totally different trajectory. Um, I think it was an excuse. I think it was a way for him to justify why, why it never worked between the two of them. Um, Strunsky, Strunsky is a really interesting figure because she wrote prolifically, but never published, really. She had this one book with Jacqueline, and she published another book that she finished, I think, around 1903 or 4, but didn't actually publish until 1915. And um, she has a lot of unfinished books in her archive. But she just constantly was writing notes. And so her archive is just thousands and thousands of, of pages of, like, just her kind of writing and trying to process things that have happened in her life. And Jack London is like one of the key things she writes constantly about. And so in reading through these notes that she's written about him, it's, it's not clear to me that she ever would have said yes to him. He was a difficult person. He also had a tendency to drink and party a little hard. She was very conservative in um, matters of sex, yet he was someone who was known for his wandering libido. You know, like, um, I'm not sure she really would have ever said yes. I think she was just more taken with the fantasy and this kind of bigger than life persona he had. And also the fact that he was a successful writer and she aspired to be one, but never was really going to be one. But yeah, um, it, it's a mystery and there's, a, there's been a lot written about it. People trying to figure this out. We have a question from the chat. Uh, someone wants to know, did either Sister Mary Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, great question. So um, this might be really far back. So let's see. So um, Anna Strunsky, um, she ended up marrying William English Walling. So three weeks after she arrived in Russia and at Walling's invitation, they announced their engagement. So um, their story is a, a really, really wild one. Um, he they basically from the moment she arrived just kind of went into this kind of romantic rabbit hole and just spent a very intense three weeks together they claim that the moment at which they decided they were in love with one another was when they were in a cafe and a russian um a russian officer had come in and asked a student to stand up and kind of salute him and he wouldn't do it and so the russian officer shot the student to um, to death right there in front of them. They said in this kind of like moment, they had this, this reckoning and they decided that they needed to spend their lives together. And so they married, um, they had four surviving kids, I think seven or eight pregnancies. Their firstborn died at, I think, five days old. Um, he would become a famous and noted organizer, one of the founders of the NAACP. Um, and there's some really interesting questions there about whether Anna was really more of the visionary, but she was pregnant, dealing with morning sickness, and not really getting to be present. So they, they kind of spent their lives organizing behind the scenes, um, agitating on behalf of socialist causes. Then the war came. Um, he went completely um, pro-U.S. entry into the war. She stayed on the side of the Bolsheviks, and their marriage just kind of crumbled after that. Uh, Rose Stransky continued to date, um, and in 1917 or 18, she ended up marrying a fellow Russian Jewish immigrant, um, uh, Louis Lorwin, who was a noted econ 
economist. He taught classes at Columbia, later would move them to Madison, Wisconsin to teach, and um, they ended up staying married throughout most of their, throughout their lives. And they have two kids. Well, if there are no more questions, you have timed that perfectly. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you all. For your